but let's let's just let's just begin at the beginning. Um, at a certain point, I'm going to open up a screen here, and, and so I can draw diagrams on it. And I can awesome. It. That I think comes out in your recording as well, but I'll try and be vociferous in case it doesn't. So, um, uh, you know, in the beginning, in the in the early days of well, actually, let, let's begin with with um, uh, some very early terminology. Um, so you're familiar with with uh, uh, radio stations that are AM or FM, right? Yeah. Amplitude modulation and frequency modulation. So uh, additionally, there's a way, and both of those are, are way. The modulation is a way of putting information into a signal, and you can amplitude modulate a carrier. You can frequency modulate a carrier. You also can do what another term be real familiar is pulse width modulation. And you can put information in a signal by sending a pulse and changing the width of that pulse. Behave as ones and zeros. And that's called PCM, pulse code modulation. That's where that name comes from. And what that means is that the different pulses, the different steps in that signal are ones and zeros representing a code. And then we have what's called linear PCM. All these, I'm sure the term linear PCM is very familiar to you, but the, the, what that means is that that code linearly represents the signal. So it's, it's basically a stair step uh, of the span of the signal divided into le quantized levels. And um, you know, that's our familiar uh, D to A, 16-bit PCM, 16-bit linear, 8-bit PCM, 8-bit linear. Uh, you know, now we get up to, you know, these days, 24 and 32-bit linear coding. Okay? So that, that's where those come from. And back in the day, uh, um, uh, DACs were expensive. Um, and uh, uh, computers were expensive. Most computers were 8-bit. Um, so the, um, uh, the, the phone company... When they started going digital, they, they looked at this stuff and um, they were using 8-bit PCM and found that it sounded crummy. Uh, so they invented a uh, concept which was called companding. And um, it was basically a floating point representation in the 8 bits. So, um, if you think about 8-bit um, linear PCM, you've got the most significant bit. That's the big step. That's really, is it a plus or minus signal? And then you've got the next most significant bit, the, you know, bit uh, uh, six, if we're numbering them seven through zero, is going to be halfway to full code on either the plus or minus side. Then we've got the next one's half of that, and so on and so forth. So we've got this you know, binary tree. And so you end up with, 256 equal size steps as to what, what the code represents. Um, are you familiar with, with uh, um, the numeric concept of floating point in computers? Have you ever dealt with? Vague, vaguely, yeah, yeah, oh, vaguely. Okay. Like okay, on, so, on a generalized scale. Yeah, yeah. So floating point numbers allow you to cover a much wider span of numbers. You know, if, if you got a... Um, uh, a 32-bit computer, uh, 32 bits gives you, you know, uh, um, what? Uh, I'm going to show show my ignorance here, and that I don't know that right off. But I, th I think it's a um, um, uh, uh, four giga. Uh, you know, um, it's near uh, infinite. Headroom yeah, that's, yeah, yeah, that. yeah, four four no, four billion different steps. But four billion is, is only ten to the ninth. And if you start dealing with scientific numbers, I mean, we, we can't even go from a picofarad to a farad with 10 to the ninth steps. So we have to either make more bits, go to 64 or 128 bit words, or instead we can slice up and we can say, well, you know, I don't need to know that it's one farad down to, you know, nine or 10 digits of precision or even more. Uh, I only need, need a, 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 you know, uh, a tenth of a percent or a hundredth of a percent. So what I can do there is create a floating point number where I have three, 
it's actually done with three different pieces of the, of the number. We divide the, the binary scale up into um, the, uh, what's called the mantissa. And those are the equally spaced steps that I'm gonna deal with. That determines my accuracy, whether I can get a 10th percent or 100%, it would determine your distortion in audio. Um, then I've got what we call the exponent. And that's how, where I'm gonna shift the mantissa and the number, or you know, how many zeros I'm gonna place after it. Um, and uh, you know, in, in standard 32-bit format, we have a 24-bit mantissa, a seven-bit exponent, and one bit of sine, because it's much easier to do floating point with a splitting plus and minus rather than what we call two's complement, where they're all in one continuous thing. And that was exactly what they did with this companding idea. They said, let's have um, four bits of equal size steps. Okay, so I've just got 16 different levels, but then I'll have three more bits that move those steps around so that uh, I get 16 different levels at the highest level if I've got a loud sound, but I've got a quiet sound. I've got 16 different levels of the quieter sound. And then I've got a sign bit. And there were two different uh, uh, standards that the telephone company created called Mu Law and A Law that were um, uh, just different ways of the way you treated things around zero, whether you whether you had two zero, a positive zero and negative zero, or the positive zero was plus a half and the negative zero was minus half. And then you had that little uh, uh, seg segment in between be, be uh, uh, you know, not have a funny step in the, in the middle. So that, those were the, the, the two laws. And uh, uh, you could buy a D to A converter called a ComDAC. Um, and it fit very nicely with the analog technology of the time. You, you know, made these even steps with 16 uh, resistors that didn't have to have tremendously good tolerances. They were easier to make than, than an 8-bit linear DAC where that, that MSB resistor had to be really, really accurate uh, uh, to get. And uh, you know, then they could use current switching to change the, um, uh, uh, the, the exponent, the gain on, the, on that. And, and this was a part you could buy, and it, it wasn't terribly expensive. It was a few bucks. Um, and uh, multiple source and things like that. And um, yeah, all of us in the business knew uh, that, that we're looking at digital audio, knew about companding. It was telephone quality, so it was kind of crappy. Um, but uh, uh, the idea, which meant that you could get more dynamic range, uh, you know, sacrificing some fidelity, uh, we understood was a, was a good idea. That, that's sort of the state of the art back in what, 70, 677, somewhere around in there. Um, and the first person that I know of that ever used a ComDAC in a popular music product was Roger Lynn, the LM1 okay. drum machine. And Roger uh, used ComDACs in that and 8-bit ROMs and found that for drum sounds, it actually sounded pretty good. You could get away with using uh, companding in that. Um, I did the design review in the LM1 for Roger um, and uh, uh, was impressed with how good it sounded, and, and it was simple. So that was the first use of combanding, and we just stole the part that the telephone companies were using. And it's this very simple, um, uh, you, know, you put a number in and we just expand it to, you know, if I pull up my, uh, let's see if I, the white, whiteboard works here. Uh, linear, linear PCM, which was an evenly spaced staircase. So now something that's got little tiny steps around zero and then bigger steps there, and then mm -hmm. still bigger steps up here. So that if I put in a loud sine wave, I get big steps. If I put in a quiet sine wave, I get little steps. Mm -hmm. And overall on the um, smaller noises, I get less distortion. I don't have uh, crossover or quantization distortion of the small noises, and it works decently. So when we did the emulator one, we just did the same thing. Roger had showed it sounded good, and so we the emulator one was also just straight mu law companion. Uh, 
different size steps. And so that, that was the beginning of compounding and the most straightforward one. And we just stole something from telephony, which will be a theme throughout what I tell you here. Okay, so um, now we move on. Oh, we also did the drumulator. And the drumulator, just like the, the LM1, was straight 8-bit compounding, mu law compounding. Um, and the way you do the A to D converter is you just put that D to A converter in a feedback loop and, and it works just like a regular A to D converter. It, it just, you use a commanding D to A in your A to D and everything works. Um, so then um, we uh, started re researching into the emulator too, and we wanted to get better fidelity. Um, and we're looking at different ways to do it. And um, uh, it actually was uh, um, a circuit I saw out of an MXR reverb that turned me on to this. And then uh, Dana Massey, who I think you know, I don't know if you know Dana, but the uh, uh, you know, name pops up all over the place. He was my DSP guy, uh, said, oh yeah, that's, that's called D-Star PCM. Uh, and I looked up D-Star PCM on the internet, and it appears that I'm the only person that ever has called it that, other than Dana who told me. <laughs> that, that um, uh, I think the name was not popular very well. You'll find DPCM on the internet, differential PCM. And differential PCM, we, we're gonna take a different approach. Rather than sending uh, the samples in that pulse code modulation, we're gonna send the differences between the samples down the pulse code. So if, you know, uh, if I've got a, a ramp waveform, I'm going to send a, a series of ones and it's going to step up one each time. If I've got a downward ramp, I'm going to send negative one. If I've got a sine wave, I really end up sending a cosine wave because that's the, uh, you know, the derivative, if you know any calculus at all, but it's basically the slope of the sine wave is a cosine. Um, and basic DPCM, just sending the difference, it doesn't really do you any good at all. But then you can use compounded DPCM, and that gives you some, some good because it turns out that when you listen to sounds and look at their waveform, it's the base waveforms that are really high amplitude. And they have, they're moving slowly. The treble waveforms, we seldom listen to full amplitude, two or three K sine waves, it hurts our ears. Whereas I can listen to a nice loud, bass thump and it sounds great. So they tend to be smaller. And so while um, they move more quickly, their slope is lower. So um, as a result, if I, if I send the differences, uh, I send little differences, which compand really well, if I, if I now use this companding trip, trick, I can send little tiny differences and get very good accuracy, very little distortion in the bass wave. When I go up to the treble waveforms, now I need bigger differences, but they're happening quicker so, um, and, and with lower amplitude, so I never need the really high amplitude steps that are, uh, that are quantized. So it turns out that um, that's a, a big win in terms of fidelity. That was why the emulator uh, two, we, we could say, had the equivalent of 12 to 14 bit fidelity. And there's one other trick, and that's the star in this D star PCM. Because I'm taking differences, right? So when I go to send you a sample, I say, well, what, what, what value did you have? What, um, what value did everything add up to up to this point? What new value do I want? I'll send you the difference. What value are we? Uh, now I remember that. You remember that. You're the, you're the D to A converter. I send you another difference, and, and our sums stay in line. One issue, what happens if you get confused and forget, and I'm sitting here sending you differences, and once you've forgotten, we're, we're completely out of phase. You'll end up with a DC offset from what I want. Not good. So if I start playing a sound in the middle or I change the volume or things like that, uh, you know, we both change the volume, we can end up with a mess. So what we add to that is something called leakiness. So that every time we update, the difference, we also say, and let's take away, um, I think the number we actually used was uh, um, uh, one part in 256. 
but let's just decrease the thing. So if I, if I start sending you zeros, wherever you are, you're not going to stay there. You're gonna, the, the DNA converger is going to slowly drift back down to zero again. So that we add the leaking. And then here's the other trick that we do. Because I'm doing this, this uh, companding, I'm quantizing. I'm, I'm, I, you know, the, I can actually say, here's where I want to get, but I can't get exactly there because my difference is, you know, if it's a big step, I have to you know, uh, approximate that more than if it's a little step. But if I keep track of where I actually told you to go with the big step and where I wanted you to go, and next time send you not the difference of where I wanted you to go, but where I told you to go, I can get a correction into that of any previous quantization error. And so by doing that, and that's the D star where I'm actually uh, correcting to the quantized rather than the unquantized value, that now improves the quality even more. And all of this, it turns out, is pretty easy to do in the analog of the D to A and A to D converter. They, they just, the only thing you add is a sample hole to do that memory and a resistor to do that leaking. It. And um, away you go. So it was really easy to put into the emulator too. Um, and it was all implemented in this analog fashion. And again, you can do the A to D converter just by putting that whole thing in a feedback loop. Um, so so, that, so uh, you're saying that that was all very easy to add in, but still left out of like when you would do the 1200, uh, was that just a strictly like parts thing where you were just like you said it's very easy to do it in the analog um mm -hmm. was it just a matter of just trying to strip down as few parts as possible or yeah it was, it was, so, so we we did it in the emulator too everybody liked it when we came out with uh, the sp12 which was originally named the drumulator 2 um internally um we co considered we can leave it 8 bit we Companding just like the drumulator one, we said that's not good enough. We're not going to do that. At the time, it was possible, but extremely expensive, to go all the way to 16 bit, 16 bit linear coding. And um, we knew that Roger Lin was considering 16 bit coding for the Lin 9000, what would become the Lin 9000. We didn't know what it's called, but uh, you know. I, I've forgotten how we knew, but we, we, we maybe we just guessed that he was thinking of going to 16 bit, or, or maybe he left and it's small there. small industry circles too. So it's right, exactly, exactly. Um, so, but we decided that way you know, that would just um, uh, push the price of the thing uh, well above five thousand dollars, and that wasn't where we we're going to go. And ultimately, the Lin 9000 came out at a pretty high price, and I think had the capability, if I remember correctly, of going to 16 bit. Um, and then we had the idea of using the same coding as the emu emulator two, and that was attractive. Uh, but at the same time, the price of 12-bit linear D to A converters um, dropped down enough. And that was pretty much the equivalent uh, in um, uh, optimum fidelity of the emulator two, but because it had all those extra steps, uh, as well, it's actually a little better. I mean, the linear coding uh, uh, is a hair better than the floating point. If you can get the same overall span, you're going to get good fidelity all the way through. Whereas we, we instead have even fidelity through the steps in, in the in the uh, companion thing. Um, and then it turned out there were a couple little tricks in the in the SP12 that uh, uh, that pointed to using the 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 12 bit converter. You know, just a little clever, oh, I can, if I do this, then I can do that type of thing. And, and so that's often how we decided our, our design decisions is when you started seeing these synergies between one part of the thing and uh, the other part of the thing. But, um, I don't know if there was any, I, I have to go back and really think about it and say if there was any between the drop sample and the 12-bit. The, um, the, the but uh, um, at any rate, it was, it, as you say, it was, it was one of these uh, um, choices of where do we want this thing to go? What features do we want it to have? You know, we, we can't be too expensive. Uh, and we wanted to do something a little different as well. Uh, the, 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 the drum machine stuff was a little different. So that's how we ended up with using 12-bit linear PCM, not companion at all, 
in the SP12, um, even though the emulator two was this companion thing. So okay. yeah, real quick, ahead. before we yeah. move on to that, um, yeah. so does that relate, and this, this is showing my ignorance admittedly, but does that relate directly to the sample rate um, that, that's used for them? No, no, the, the, the coding is completely independent of the sample rate. Um, so, uh, uh, you know, I think we upped the sample rate in the, the SP12 from that of the drumulator. Um, I've forgotten what, what we did in the sample rate of the emulator too. Uh, but the emulator too was a was a, a variable sample rate machine, whereas the uh, you know it didn't do drop sample. It actually varied the sample rate, uh, the the clock, as did the emulator one. But the uh, the drum emulator and drum emulator was just fixed sample rate, and the SP12 used drop sample to vary the the pitch of the sound, keeping a fixed sample rate. Um, yeah, that's that's kind of what I was wondering about is is to how that all related, right? Um, because when you start moving the pitch around, how how that fidelity changes and and you know is altered with that com with the companding versus the linear, right? Right, and the and the two are really independent. The the, the companding is the fidelity, uh, and it's, it's the fidelity all the time. But it, it, the companding is there uh, w even when you're on pitch. When you go off pitch, if you do it like the emulator did and just vary the clock rate, you don't get any aliasing. Now, sometimes you bring the uh, clock away down and you hear what, what's sometimes called clocking noise, but that's really, those are really images of the sound. Those are, uh, um, uh, you know, the, the, you're getting the sample rates now dropping down into the audio range. Um, and, uh, uh, but you don't get aliasing, whereas when you, vary the the the, uh, the pitch by dropping samples or doing any kind of interpolation if you do interpolation it all depends on how good you do the interpolation uh, as to what you know how good or bad those images are those aliases are how, how high or low um, you will get you will get aliasing so even if you do linear interpolation you're going to get some aliasing when you, you even get up to like the the um, eight point the seven point interpolation we were doing in the, in the G chip machines, the, the uh, um, uh, Emacs two and uh, emulator four and, and all of those, those still have some aliasing because of that interpolation. It's just really, really down low. It's very good. Uh, but the emulator one, two, and three all, all just varied the sample rate. I guess the three X was the first thing where we used the G chip and, and did interpolation instead. So, um, Move on uh, the Emacs. Um, I got the opportunity to design a chip for free. A company called Seattle Silicon. I won a design contest with them, and, and they said, "Okay, we'll integrate your design and 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 uh, uh, pay for the integration uh, if you'll you know present papers and tell everybody about it." So the Emacs was an all digital emulator, uh, still operating with eight bit samples. And so what I did in the Emacs in that chip was digitally implemented this D star PCM. So the samples are still differences, but rather than use a comdat to you know, create the, the, those funny stair steps, instead there's a little ROM in that chip called the Expo ROM that does exactly that. Um, and uh, Again, there was, there was synergy there because uh, you know, exponentials are the opposite of logarithms. And one of the things about logarithms that is their nice property is if you want to do a multiplication and you're storing information in their logarithmic form, you just add them together. So the uh, uh, volume control in the Emacs is done while the signal is still in this differential exponential form, the comdac format, but now I can use that same ROM to do multiplication, i.e. amplitude modulation, the volume modulation of the sounds on the chip. So again, one of these, these synergistic things, um, but it's still, you know, in the, in the comdac, if you remember, we had a, a segmented floating point where we had you know, uh, uh, three bits of mantissa, which were you know, 
uh, eight evenly spaced steps. Then we'd step a bit in, in exponent. And then we had eight more evenly spaced steps with a different spacing and so on. So you had this stair step, stair step, stair step, stair step as they got bigger. In the Emacs, instead, every step was different along a completely smooth curve there. So rather than being a segmented approximation of an exponential, it was a true exponential. And that's how I could get away with this, this volume control. But it still had the, the same property of compounded D star PCM, uh, lower quantization noise um, uh, and uh, uh, um, nice fidelity across the entire range, uh, really good accuracy in the low frequency sounds, you get some grows in the higher frequency sounds, but they're at lower amplitude, so it's okay. So it's got all those nice properties. Um, so real quick, with that chip being um, basically done, um, what was, like, how did it go about for purchasing? Like, you know, to make your products, um, I, I assume you would then have to place an order through that same company that you won that. Uh, yeah. You know, one yeah. through. Was it um, very cost effective? Like, how did that work out? Oh, yeah, it was the, the chip itself. I think we ended up getting them for about 10 bucks, something like that, which was, um, you know, given it, it was 16 channels and all of that, it was really a big cost save. Uh, the main problem we had was the, uh, the layout of the chip. Seattle Silicon made a mistake on it. Uh, this was a kludge at the last end that the, the, you know, the, the router wouldn't quite route the chip. So, uh, you know, this was in the early days of silicon compilers. So they ran some what are called polylines across the chip and it turned out they weren't quite fast enough. So the company that made it, which was NCR, National Cash Register, was in the chip business at the time and they actually made the chip, had to process the chip a little specially and we had to run the chip at a little higher voltage than we would expected to. Um, so all of that made the machine a little tweaky. Um, it worked, but it was working on hummingbird eyelashes to tell the truth. Now, now, did that cause like failure rates in the units or was it just a matter of like, oh, we just got to be very careful with the voltages that we're sending? Right, that, it, that's that exactly sort of right. You had to get tighter tolerance voltages. And then, you know, you know a lot of them are still running today. So, no, it, it didn't really cause any any failure rates. Uh, My, mine still works perfect. So, ah, good, yeah, <laughs> though, I do have a different disk drive in there. So. Ah, yeah. Um, anyway, so that's uh, um, that's the. Uh, uh, as far as EMU went with compounding, I think the last thing we did that had compounding was um, uh, the Emacs. And it had this continuous curve D star PCM, which is a differential compounding system. The other two things I know about are the Kurzweil 250. Um, uh, the Kurzweil 250 was Kurzweil's uh, instrument. Uh, I got to see my first one when Alan Howarth, you know who Alan Howarth is? I um, don't. He, he's a, a studio musician, um, uh, pretty well known in the LA area. Uh, I'm sure he's retired now, but uh, he, he did a lot of music for films and things like that. Uh, you probably can Google him. Really nice guy. And he, he was a long time EMU fan and friend. And, and he got one of the early Kurzweil 250s and phoned me up and said, Dave, I've got a Kurzweil 250. You want to come down and take it apart? <laughs> I said, I can't resist an offer like that. Alan. So I actually packed up my uh, uh, Tektronix oscilloscope and hopped on an airplane, <laughs> flew down to Alan's place and uh, uh, took apart his Kurzweil 250. Um, and uh, uh, the th I don't know if you remember, uh, you were probably pretty young when the 250 came out, but uh, uh, the claim that Kurzweil was making was he was doing all this magic DSP, which none of the rest of us could really afford to do. If you, you, uh, at that point, you couldn't get a multiplier for, very, uh, for a reasonable amount of money. They cost like $300. Um, and you need a multiplier to really do digital signal processing. So uh, we were all sort of faking it uh, with, 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 with these things. And uh, um, so uh, I opened up the Kurzweil 250 and looked at it. And it basically turned out it was they weren't using the compounding thing that we did, but other than that, it basically was an emulator. You know, they were 
shifting the 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 pitch of the sound by changing the clock rates. Um, we had tracking analog filters. They had tracking switch capacitor filters. But the basic block diagram was the same as an emulator too. Uh, and I told Alan this, and uh, uh, um, he said, "Oh, that can't possibly be true." And showed me this this feature on the Kurzweil 250. And he'd play this little piano riff, and uh, and then he'd say, "Now switch this switch here." And he plays it again, and it sounds just slightly timbrely different. And then he switches it a little more, and he plays it again. Now it begins to sound more like a honky tonk piano. And he says, "That's got to be Ray playing with the numbers here." So I sat down with it, and rather than playing piano riffs because I don't, I, I'm musically incompetent, um, I you know, put the switch in one position and play each note and listen really carefully. And I put it to another position and play each note, and listen really carefully, and switch it again. And it turned out that all Kurzweil was doing, it was a multi-sample piano, you know, a different sample every few keys. When you flip the switch, it moved the multi-sample boundary one semitone. And so the note in between the samples went from being played on sample uh, one to being played on sample two, and then sample two to sample three, and so on. And that, when you play a little riff, you hear the one note in the riff has changed timbre, but the others haven't. So you hear just a little timbral shift as you play these things quickly. And that was all he was doing. It, it, was, it had nothing to do with any digital signal processing. So really that came it. down to just some, some clever sound design. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So it was sound design and, a, and a, a cute little idea for this, this, this switch. So anyway, um, but one of the things I learned in taking apart that Kurzweil 250 is the way they were doing uh, compounding, they used 8-bit linear PCM, but they had a 10-bit wide ROM. Well, actually, it was a, you, ROMs are always 8-bit wide. So they had an 8-bit wide ROM, four of those, and then they had one more ROM that was the extra two bits on each one of those. And those extra two bits, only two of them, not three, were the exponent. So you had an 8-bit mantissa and a 2-bit exponent, but it was still um, non-differential. It was, it was linear compounding but it got them an extra 12 dBs of dynamic range, you know, two bits, uh, four, four, no, six, extra 24 bits of di uh, dBs of dynamic range, six dBs for each power of two step. And each one of these was a bit of power of two step. So they got, it wasn't quite as wide a range. We were using three bits of Mantis in, in our original com deck, but only four or three bits of exponent and four bits of Mantis. Now he was using eight bits of Mantissa and two bits of exponent. So he really got um, the, the extra two bits gave him four more places. So he was getting about 12 bit fidelity out of a 10 bit ROM and an eight bit D to A converter with, with then some uh, uh, gain switching around that. It's almost so almost like you guys had had flipped opposite ideas of how to do it. Yeah, right? yeah, exactly. I mean, it was all, all well, they were back with the emulator one of, of it being not differential companion. So he wasn't getting these improvements in uh, quantization noise and, and uh, uh, you know, low frequency fidelity that we were. Um, but he was getting good enough fidelity that, uh, you know, when people listen to it, that you know, it was 12 bits. It sounded for the time. This was, what, 1984. 85 times, it, it sounded fun. You know, people were happy with it. Um, and then the other one that I know, but I did some form of compounding, but I never figured out exactly what they were doing was the Roland sound cam. And I'm pretty sure that had to be some kind of differential compounding. But I never, I, I played with it for a day or so. I took one apart and looked at it. And, uh, um, it was something pretty sophisticated. The guys at Roland are pretty smart. They, you know, of all the competitors Emu had, I think Emu and Roland. I, I know the president of Roland once said to a guy he didn't know was a friend of mine on an airplane. He said, "You know, the big companies like you know Moog and uh, 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 Kurzweil and so on. You know, I, I never worry about what they do, but the, the, this little guy Emu, they're the guy that really scares me." Um, that's and, the kind of compliment you want to hear exactly kind of right. in the back room you know right, right. And, and i always said about roland i said you know yamaha they're just a 600 pound gorilla um you know the same with with, with Korg. but but roland uh 
you know, they're really clever. You know, they've got some awfully sharp engineers that come up with really innovative stuff. So um, I never got to meet the, the president of the world. I thought it would have been fun, but I, I tend to be, uh, uh, you know, not, not out there the way Dave Smith is at, at all the conventions and so on. So I never made those, those connections, but I think, uh, that's, why I I know, try, like, that's why I always try to hunt you down. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Once you get me, yeah. You know, once you get me talking, you can't, can't shut me up. But, uh, um, so anyway, that, that, so like I said, the sound canvas had some kind of, uh, sophisticated companding along the lines of what we were doing in, um, the Emacs. Uh, but I, I, I don't know exactly what it was. And I'm not sure if anybody, uh, it, it, there's any knowledge about that in the public domain. But uh, um, again, about that same time, you know, a little bit, a little before the, the the sound canvas came out, uh, Casio came out with the first 16-bit synth, and um, you know we followed that up with the emulated um, uh, three was 16 bits, um, and then we started getting into uh, 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 you know getting really good 24-bit converters for audio. The, the so it would have been like Proteus, right? Yeah. Uh, well, well, Proteus, uh, Proteus was still using discrete 16-bit uh, converters on the G chip, um, and uh, but we were using uh, Sigma Delta converters for the sampling for that. And then um, I'm trying to think of Probably it was the Emacs 2 was the first thing where we started using the, the modern generation of, of uh, um, uh, actually the Proteus had 20 bit converters in it. You could get those uh, standard PCM linear converters, uh, again, resistor ladder type of thing. But um, the Sigma Delta A to D converters came out first. And I think maybe we even had one of those in, um, in the E3, we certainly had that in the, in the, in the Emacs too. Um, but then um, uh, the, uh, the, the Sigma Delta D to, D to A converters came out and that sort of knocked everything wide open. Plus uh, that, then we started using a lot of digital audio that uh, uh, you know, the SPDIF and AES EBU became popular. People wanted their individual channels out channel outs and and everything was going going digital then and it was that was all linear coding now today um uh you will find people that do their digital recording in 24-bit fixed point 32-bit fixed point and 32-bit floating point and the floating point is once again you know 24 bits of mantis actually I, I, th I think I misspoke. I think it's 23 bits of Mandisa, one sign and eight bit of exponent in the standard 32-bit uh, floating point format. I think they steal the bit for the sign from the Mantisa, not from the, from the uh, exponent. Um, but at any rate, uh, um, you'll find people that, that you know, do their recording in floating point and people that do it in, 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 uh, in fixed point. But... Um, uh, my friend Julius Smith. Do you know, do you know Julius Smith? Um, I think I've remember. heard the name, but I don't think I've ever met yeah. him. Yeah, he. he if, if you want to read uh, stuff that is um, accurate but understandable about DSP, look up Ju Julius Smith stuff. He's a professor at Stanford, but he has the knack of explaining things in such a clear way that you know you really get them across. Yeah, get in more deeply. <laughs> <laughs> into a stuff when you got to get into the heavy math, but, but uh, he's just, he's a fabulous educator as well as being a brilliant, brilliant uh, um, guy. Um, anyway, uh, uh, Julius Smith pointed out that the ratio of the pressure, the amplitude of the pressure wave of the molecular motion of air against your eardrum, that's, the low end of sounds that we can conceivably hear to that of a sonic boom, a shock wave in air, where the pressure wave is limited by the ability of air itself is less than a factor of two to the 24. So 24-bit audio is sufficient 
to represent any sound we can hear with the noise below the molecular, the quantization noise below the molecular motion uh, of, of the air and the loudest sound that you can hear being louder than the air will propagate. So 24-bit linear is adequate to represent uh, audio, and there's no point in going any further. Um, if you wanted to say, but I want to go further, uh, the other thing is that um, uh, the fidelity of floating point, because it's got a 24-bit mantissa, and remember, it's the mantissa, it's those equally shaped steps that determine the distortion. You get no lower distortion from 32-bit floating point than you do from 24-bit fixed point in your audio. You're, so the exponent really isn't doing you much good at all. If you went to 32-bit fixed point, then you get um, the extra eight bits improve your distortion. And since you can still cover that 24 bits dynamically. So uh, floating point um, for uh, representing an audio signal is really not a particularly good idea. You can do it, it will work, you're not going to lose anything. But it's you know you're not gaining. But, but the advantages of internal is is where I think a lot of us are really using it. That yeah, you you caught me. That was exactly what I was going to say. Is that when the signal represents a true sound wave in air, what I said is true. But in DSP, we often take the differences of sound waves in air, and those will give you signals that you need. You know, you even even uh, single precision floating point isn't good enough. You need a fifty six bit man test simply to maintain. Those. And you even can find DSP algorithms for, for a double precision floating point isn't good enough to maintain audible uh, lack of distortion. Um, so yes, once you get into actually doing DSP, and that's one of the, the, the um, uh, skills in, in designing DSP algorithms is understanding you know, not only the math of the algorithm is correct, but the uh, coding of each of the signals in there, is it numerically well behaved? You know, you'll hear DSP people talk about you know, numerically well and ill behaved algorithms and so on. And that's, that's part of the, the art and science of DSP. So <laughs> that's beautiful. Um, okay, well, there we go. I think I think I've dumped my brain into your lap. So <laughs> I, yeah, I, I'm, I, yeah, like there, there's a lot to there's a lot to um, unpack on that one. Um, but that's that's essentially the vast majority of what seems to have been missing when I've been looking up and trying to research this information. Mm -hmm. Like none of the, none of that was out there. Wow. Um, so I, I mean, I tried looking all over the place to see if I could dig mm -hmm. up any information and especially for the layman, there was no, no, real, yeah. yeah, no real information on that. Well, if you write up anything and, and, uh, um, you know, if you want to shoot it by me, I'll, I'm happy to spend a few minutes looking it over and, making comments or corrections or things like that. So, you know, feel yeah, free. Yeah, absolutely. A um, couple of quick questions. Um, sure. And let me let me wrap them up in my head real quick. So um, let's talk about the most recent thing that you've done, right? So the most recent sampler would be your Eurorack one, right? The assimilator, yeah. So in that, um, you basically, you get to pick and choose everything that you want to do fidelity wise, because now like all this stuff is kind of laid at our feet. So right. um, when you were doing this, uh, I, I know that the the previous, the, the early samplers, one of the key differences between your products and something like and Sonic uh, early products was that you kind of were tailoring the frequencies a little bit more mm -hmm. for the musician. Did you kind of make the same kind of ideas for the, the Eurorack sampler and, and doing that sort of thing? Or is it more just like leave it open and make everything as high fidelity as possible or what? So, so the, the core um, sample engine inside the assim assimilator takes advantage of uh, what's called the neon subprocessor of the ARM processor in that. And the neon is, uh, do you know the word, do you know, have you heard of SIMD? In uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Single instruction, multiple data. So, so the neon processor is a is a SIMD core uh, that's been optimized for, um, among other things, signal processing. And I was able to um, push that thing very much to its limit with a um, 
uh, semi brute force algorithm. You know, brute force because the SIMD is so powerful. I just have a lot of brute force uh, to put it for the the sample interpolator. So it's got you know a really wide interpolator, and that's largely the trick of how it works. Now there, there are the things that I'll, I'll keep proprietary as to how you manage to get that to, to work and work over both pitch shifting up and pitch shifting down. But, but basically that thing in and of itself is just a very high fidelity, high um, ratio. You can go uh, up five, five or six octaves and down you know, 20 or 30 octaves if you want. Uh, the da down is going easy, up is, up is much harder to do. Um, with, with uh, um, you know, excellent to very good fidelity under those circumstances. So that's, that's the basic engine that runs the assimilator. Now, the other thing, and this is a completely different talk that we could have someday, and I, I've been giving that talk uh, ever since I first understood it after Julia Smith uh, uh, wrote a paper and, and, and explained the basics of it to me. And I met a guy named Mark Dolson down at Caltech who also helped my understanding, along with, you know, of course, Dana was, was really one of the key people behind that as well, Dana Massey. But um, what I realized is that the fidelity of any interpolator or really any sampler, anything that's operating at a constant sample rate can be defined completely by its, what's called its filter function. So you can reduce the algorithm always into a filter that is just, you know, has a frequency response. Now that frequency response is not just the audio band because there's oversampling involved. So it, it goes out into the megahertz and has to be well-defined over all that range. But once you've got that filter well-defined, you've got that resampling algorithm, the, 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 the interpolation or drop sampling or you know, whatever we want to do. If it, if it uh, changes pitch, and keeps the same sample rate, and isn't doing any time domain stuff. Isn't isn't uh, you know trying to do uh, 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 temporal comp uh, uh, compensation and things like that. You know, shift the pitch, but keep the uh, uh, keep the tempo the same. That that's a whole different story. Along the way, uh, that can be characterized by this filter. So what I take advantage of when I go to play with the fidelity in the assimilator is I just have a lot of control over that filter in, in this very sophisticated interpolator. So if I use a really good filter, you know, I get the really good results. And if I degrade the filter, I can make it exactly like a drop sample filter, or exactly like a linear interpolator filter, or I can make it really horrible. If you want to turn the aliasing way up, I can make it way worse than any of those by just screwing up the filter something awful. And that's how it works. So. Um, okay. Yeah. So that's kind of what I was figuring on. So you basically have the flexibility then to, to kind of right. make it sound however right. you want. And if you want to go vintage sounding, you can go vintage. And if you, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And it's all done with this, this kind of magic understanding of, uh, you know, if I, if I, if I control the filter, I control the world. And then, then you just have to get clever about that. So that was one, that was one of the brainstorms in, in the assimilator was, uh, after I got the, cause you know, the original goal was I, I, um, you know, in, in, in real world samplers, you know, people want to shift their, their samples, you know, a semitone or two or three. Um, and I said, nah, you're a people. They want to go octaves. So let's, let's go. Exactly. Up so that was the first step is, you know, design something that can go octaves. And then the next step was, and now what else can I uh, do fun with it with, a, with so many control voltages and uh, that the, the control of the aliasing was, was one of those things. But, you know, it all comes out of, you know, Marco asking, Dave, could we voltage control aliasing? No, nah, we can't do that. And you know, the, the Scott Wedge just used used to say about me. You know, once I told him it was something was impossible, I'd figure out how to do it the next day or so. Yeah, I I um I have the the ER three hundred one sound uh -huh. computer. Yeah. And I, I kind of built like a super crude emulation of that kind of base where I was like side chaining the, the sample rate and that sort uh -huh. of thing to kind of kind of emulate these sorts of controls and, and play with that stuff. Uh -huh. And nowadays, like you said, with, with being able to kind of go to these extremes, it's it's always fun to do that. But with the assimilator, it's like, you know, you listen to that thing and it, you can keep it clean so low. It's it's 
absurd. Yeah. Like you don't hear that 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 crunching or breaking up unless you want it, which is yeah. which is pretty incredible. Um, I have one last question, and this okay. is uh, actually for Brad. Um, oh, okay. Because he bugs me about this all the time. He's like, if you ever talk to Dave again, ask him <laughs> this. So, uh, which I think you might have actually talked about it, but he's always asking me about the Proteus. And it, if I recall correctly, he's asking me if the Proteus, um, I guess the format was the same as sound font. Um. I think the answer is no. Um, okay. We did the sound font. Uh, we designed the um, the G chip, um, which was our our seven point interpolating chip mm -hmm. uh, for the uh, yeah that was the engine in the Proteus and and several of our other samples. But the first place it appeared was the Proteus, um, and. Um, that used 16-bit uh, ROMs, but I, th I think it had its own custom preset format that had nothing to do with sound form. Then we did um, the G, uh, that was the G chip 1.0. And then uh, when we started, when the protest really took off, we realized that the chip wasn't optimal for that. So we did something called the G chip 1.5 that brought in a bunch of the external circuitry we had to put around the original G chip to make it work in that particular function on, on chip. But it was basically exactly the same mathematically as the G chip 1.0. And a lot of the later Proteus and, and you know, Proteus clone projects used the G chip 1.5. Um, and it was optimized for using ROM sounds, machines with ROM sounds. The G chip 1.0 was really for RAM was, was where it, what it was optimized for. Um, then I designed another chip called the, the G chip 2.0. And that was the thing that uh, powered uh, the emulator for and beyond uh, the SI32 and all, all that kind of stuff. And it could be daisy chained to put two chips together, which gave you 128 voice. And um, could span uh, the, the, its ability to, uh, um, Interface with with memory, you could get you know ridiculously large amounts of memory and things like that. Now, was um, that was that close to how like uh, so when you did the software, you did like Emulator X. Was uh, that pretty close to, to that as far as what it could do? I don't know like, too much about the Emulator X. I do know that the Emulator X guys asked me a lot of questions about the the G chip 2.0. But the clever thing about G, G chip 2.0 was. Um, uh, it had cache memory, so it didn't have to go out and interpolate anew each time it went to do a sample. And that uh, the G chip 2.0 was probably the, the hardest solo chip I ever designed in my life because it was entirely my design. And it worked the first time, and that surprised the hell out of me because I was really out there on Hummingbird I last year. Um, anyway, to get back to answering Brad's question, um, after that, that, I finished the G chip 2.0 right about the time we were talking, began talking with Creative about uh, getting together. And Creative wanted um, a interpolator for the PC market. So I designed something which I called the G chip 0 0.5, which was rather than a seven or eight point interpolator, it became a four point interpolator. And as we developed that, there we needed a format to be able to share the sounds that it could play in the PC world. And that was the creation of sound form. Okay. So it was that G chip 0 0.5, which went in the, I think it was first appearance was the sound blaster. AWE was, was where the G chip 0 0.5 went in. Funny story <laughs> about the, the, the G chip 0 0.5. One, G chip 0 0.5, like, unlike the others was designed to be a, a, a sampler on a chip. And one of the things we put on that chip was, a um, well, I put envelope engines and things like that as well on the chip, and we also put a reverb engine on the thing. And for about two years, I was fighting with the guys that in EMU marketing because um, we had used an analog devices DSP as our reverb engine, 
which was kind of expensive. It was about 10 bucks. And by the time creators started buying the GTIP 0.5, it cost 50 or 60 cents. So it was like 20 times as expensive as the GTIP 0.5. And it was a 16-bit processor. The, the internal reverb processor in the GTIP 0.5 was a 24-bit processor. Uh, now, it was, it was also using uh, some compounding in the way it stored its samples. Uh, it was, it was it so, storing samples and floating point. So there again, compounding is cropping up again, in the, this time in a reverb. Um, anyway, the guys kept hearing 0 0.5. Oh, it's a step down in fidelity. Therefore, we don't want to allow you to use it. And I finally managed to put together a completely double blind study where they could listen to the analog devices processor and the GTIP 0.5 and not know which one they were listening to. And they all universally liked the GTIP 0.5. And at that point, I finally won my argument with them and that went started going into the- You gotta listen the, with the ears the and not with the marketing numbers. <laughs> right, exactly. Or, or, or not even the marketing numbers. Yeah, well, mark, yeah, the 0.5 was a marketing number. So anyway, so, so the answer to Brad's question is no, sound fonts were not used in the Proteus. Our experience in the Proteus help us, helped us um, design the sound font idea, but it was designed for, and I think only used in the creative line, the AWE samplers and, and maybe ones after that. Well, that, I think that answers that. Thank you so, so much. Well, send my best to Brad when you pass that along. Please. Absolutely. And um, like I said, I know you're not going to be at KnobCon. Um, I don't know if you'll be at NAM this year or if you, or if we even have a NAM this year. Whatever. Yeah, who knows? Who knows? Um, but uh, yeah, I hope to see you sometime soon.